What we fight for is a collection of poems and true stories written about what it means to be black in America. It's written by a young poet and storyteller, Michaela Maddox. She joins us today. What was your inspiration for writing this compilation of stories and poems? Um, the murder of George Floyd. That was my inspiration. I remember um, when you're little, I mean, you know that you're black. Like, you know that you're black. I had my first racial, um, racist experience when I was probably about eight. And I knew, you know, that what they said to me was wrong, what happened was wrong. Um, but I still had faith in like America, you know? And I remember when Trayvon Martin was killed, like I, I realized that that's not true, that the um, judicial system is messed up and everything like that. Um, and then when George Floyd was killed, um, my church held like a, um, like a, a memorial type thing for him. And um, they asked me to um, perform a poem. So I wrote a poem for the occasion. And I remember going up there and I was shaking so hard because I'm always so nervous every time I recite um, anything. Um, but then like, you know, having all these people gathering around, um, remembering this person, it's very, very sad. And then I just kept, you know, they kept asking me to write. I kept writing and I kept doing it and people come up to me and they'd say, is there any way I could buy that poem? And I was just confused, I was like, well, like, buy a poem. They're like, is there any way I could buy that poem? You know, have you published it so I could purchase it? And I was like, huh. So, so I guess that's what got me writing the book, but the poems itself, um, what inspired me was the George, the George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd. The so. stories that are in the book, how did you go about compiling those stories? Um, I just found people in my neighborhood. So some people are my next door neighbors. Um, one girl in the book, her name is Nikki. She's literally lives right across the street from me. This other man named Grover lives across the street. I found them in particular because when George Floyd was murdered, um, the uh, Caucasians in my community decided to host a meeting about what they could do to help the cause of Black Lives Matter. And they invited me and my family to tell them how we felt. And that was the first experience I had anything like that, you know? And I got to sit there and tell them how, it, oh, attempt to tell them how it felt to be Black in America and to explain to them um, what I think that we need to do as just a, a country and everything like that. And to hear their viewpoints made me um, think of them as good candidates to be in the book. For other people, they're like my friends. Um, one of the poems is dedicated to my cousin, Nevaeh Matox. And um, so I interviewed her for it, of course, because it's, it's about her. Um, some people I found on Instagram. Some people, um, I had people that I know um, introduce me to people that are in the book that said they wanted to be a part of it. So that probably took the longest part, finding everyone, getting all the interviews together. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned when you, when you spoke to your Caucasian neighbors mm -hmm. and you said you attempted to explain to them what it was like to be black in America. Mm -hmm. Why did you say attempt? I don't think you can fully explain it when that's all you know, you know? I, I even mentioned it in my book, um, listening to the mass of my mind because I only know how to be black in America. Like you only know how to be black in America. You know, how do I describe being a girl? I don't know, it's just being a girl. It's very, it's a very difficult thing to describe. And they wanna, and they ask questions like, um, like how does it feel going to a grocery store or, you know, how does it feel when you see the police and you can describe to them yet you're worried and you're afraid and everything like that. But it's, it's so much deeper than that. And you can't really explain it unless you're in it. Um, but I think it's good to, to have that conversation, even though part of me is kind of annoyed that I even have to have it in the first place. Um, but if that's what 
we as a black community have to do to raise awareness and that's what we're due. Um, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't even, so I went there and part of me was upset that I even had to come and share. Like, why am I even at this point where I have to come and share? I feel like it's ridiculous. I feel like it, should, or it shouldn't even be an issue where I have to come and share. But since it is, I went. Um, there's only so much that I can say about being um, Black in America to a, a Caucasian person. It made me realize that um, that some they don't really think about they don't really think about it. Not all of them, but some of the people I talked to in the group they don't they didn't even think about it. Like I literally explained a time that I had to use the bathroom at a gas station, and it was the only gas station for miles on the road trip, and there was a Confederate flag hanging on the house next door to the gas station. And I have all these scenarios going through my head about how this person who lives in that house probably knows the owners of the gas station because the gas is right there and they probably drive. And I notice how I'm the only black person in this entire gas station. All of a sudden the world gets very, very small and I have to choose, do I use the bathroom or not? I muster up the courage to go into the bathroom, figuring out, should I put my hood on so people don't see my skin? Well, no, that makes it worse. They'll see my hand and they'll see my hood on and they'll think I'm a criminal. So I can't do that. So I rush into the stall and I'm like, okay, at least I'm in the stall. And now they can't see my skin because I'm in the stall. And I look down at my feet and I'm wearing sandals and my feet are black. So this is a very defeating feeling. And that's what I told him, the man. And he was like, oh, wow. I never understood why the Confederate flag was offensive, but now I do. And that was just so amazing to me that you never thought about that. He just thought about it as history. And they just, so we have to be the ones to tell them because some people just don't think about it and it needs to be thought about. And you said that, of course, it's important to have these conversations and I'm so glad that you did. And thank you for sharing that story. My question is, as you reached out to your friends and your neighbors and they began sharing their personal experiences with you, what are some of the things that you learned about some of the things that they had gone through? Did you find that it was similar to the experience you just described? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us have similar experiences. Um, one of the, one of the um, stories in particular that stuck out to me was Grover's story. Um, the old man, and he grew up in this, like, the South Alabama on a farm with his many brothers and sisters. Um, and he had his teenage years while Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were um, very prepared in that community. And he was telling me about that. And he was telling me about how he said he doesn't think he'll get to live to see change, but as long as it's coming, he's okay. And that just made me so sad that after all this time, all his life, that he does not think he'll live to see change. And like past generations have fought so that he could live to see change and he can't even. And I agree with him, he probably won't. You know, at the rate we're going, he probably won't live to see it. And that, that's so sad to me because he deserves to see it, you know? And um, he probably had the story that's the most blatantly racist, um, being called a um, boy, the N-word, you know, just casually. Um, then like other people's stories more about microaggression, you know, walking into the store and um, um, being followed, which has also happened to me, you know, people are, or assuming that you're stealing, which has also happened to me. Um, and then um, the stories about colorism too, um, especially what my cousin's story, who I wrote the poem about because um, my cousin's like my sister. So in the book I said, dedicated to my sister. Um, but I've been with her her whole life. We're like two peas in the pod and she's much darker complexion than me. And I've seen her struggle with um, her self-confidence and with, with people and their comments and that alone made me so sad and then reaching out to all these other dark skinned, strong black women and hearing that they have similar experiences where they get called burnt or black as spade or, oh, you're just so pretty, but I'm not into dark skinned girls. I like light skinned girls and having their, um, 
their crushes, just not like them because their skin color and all different types of stuff is just so disappointing. So a lot of it was just very disappointing, but then some of it was hopeful. Like when I interviewed um, Nikki and she was telling me about how she believed um, in reparations. I had never heard um, a Caucasian person say they believe in reparations. I was like, oh, wow. She said that she, um, I don't know if this part is in the book, but she did say that she's helping her friends of color buy property because she knows how important that is. And that was very amazing to me. And um, I remember when I was interviewing her, she started crying because she said she can't imagine um, what I have to go through, not only being a woman, which she can relate to, but being a black woman. She said she can't imagine and she started crying. And I remember looking at her and thinking, why are you crying? You know, even though of course I understand why, but it just made me realize how numb we are as a black community. And I really don't think that if we were numb, we would have made it all this way. Um, Cause you have to have thick skin, but seeing her break down and cry about me being a black woman. And I haven't even cried about being a black woman myself in my life. Um, even though I have plenty of reason to, um, it was just amazing to me. And that's where the poem Why I'm Numb came from. Because I just realized like we, we are so very numb. The fact that this woman is crying in front of me about my experiences. And in my head, I'm thinking, why are you crying? Like it's something to cry, it just is what it is, you know? So, but. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first read the book, I think the first thing that stood out to me was the title and, you know, what we fight for and the graphic on the front with, you know, persons protesting and, you know, holding up their placards and how'd mm -hmm. you come up with the title? Um, I had two, I had two, um, ideas for the title. I forgot the other one, but, um, I went to my first protest last year, the George Floyd protest in um, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and I remember being very, very scared. Very, part of me was excited because, you know, you watch everything happen in the world and you want to join and you want to help. You can't. Um, or at least I couldn't, um, but then finally I could. So I was very, um, maybe not excited, anxious to, um, to join. But then I was also very, very scared because you see things turn terribly. You see things go very bad. Um, but then I got there and I see all these people, all these people, all different types of people um, shouting his name and demanding for justice. Um, just so many people, this one lady, she even had her daughter, her little toddler daughter there with her. And I just thought, oh my gosh. Um, so that's where it came from. I tried to, it was very hard for me to pick a title because I was trying to figure out what could I say that could wrap around all these topics, this brutality, colorism, microaggression, school to prison pipeline, the racial wealth gap, the racial wealth gap. so many topics that are in my book. Um, and I thought we're all fighting for justice at the end of the day. And out of all the people that I interview, even though some people have different viewpoints, and that's the journalism side of me, I didn't want to be biased. So if someone said something and that's what they truly believe, I put it in there, even if I didn't necessarily agree with it. Because at the end of the day, we're all working towards the same goal. And so that's where the title came from. And then the, um, the picture came from me, my experience at the protest, me seeing everyone. That's what stood out to me. And so that's what I wanted to put on the cover. You said the one thing that we're all fighting for is justice. Mm -hmm. Do you think that in your lifetime, you'll see a world where there'll be equal justice for all of us? Mm, I don't know. I really don't. Part of me is very hopeful. Part of me is like, yes, we can do it. You know, it's going to happen. And I'm going to see it and my children are going to see it. Um, and the other part of me is like, I don't think it'll ever happen. Um, just because it's so embedded in the foundation of this country. But I, don't, I honestly don't know. Part of me 
well, wants to say yes and the other party wants to say no. Hopefully the part that says yes is the right part, you know. So what is it that, that allows you to remain hopeful? Because you must be hopeful, mm -hmm. you know, to, to write this book, to share these stories. There must, you must see a glimmer of hope for the future. And so what is it that keeps you hopeful that things will change? Mm -hmm. um, two things, God and um, people. There are good people out there and those people really do care and they help me stay hopeful. You know, and there are times where I'm, I'm like, there's no hope. And then I come across a person who is very hopeful and very encouraging, um, especially um, Caucasian people, because they didn't listen. America didn't listen to us when it came out of our mouth. And now we have all these Caucasian people congregating. And I think that's, that's part of what we need, because everybody has, they have privilege. Okay. And they can use their privilege for good. So I feel like that's one thing I'm hopeful in. Other one, like I said, God, because, I mean, he's really the only way anything's going to change, really, like in its truest form. And I know he doesn't agree with um, what's going on. I know he doesn't agree with it. I know it's not in his character to condone or agree with what's what um, Black people have had and are having to go through. Um, and I do believe that he wants the best for all his people, any color they are, um, and that he'll help us get through, even if it's very, very hard, which it has been. Um, and in the end, if it comes down to it, I mean, we'll all go to heaven and it won't be a problem anymore. I heard someone say once that when it comes to racism and hate, it's not so much a culture problem, it's a, it's a heart problem. And God's the only one that can change hearts. Mm -hmm. So I think you're absolutely right. What would you like people to take away after reading this book? I, I wrote this book um, with the thought in mind of putting faces to stories, which is why I have pictures. So I thought, which is why I have the people included in the first place, because I feel like if I just to write about a topic, you know, like colorism, people could say, oh, well, sure, that maybe exists for her, but that's not, it's like a one-time thing, you know, um, especially people outside of the Black community um, who don't experience it. And I really wanted to put a face to the story so people can't ignore it. It's harder to ignore something when the person who's experienced experienced is looking right at you. Um, even most people, because there's multiple people per um, poem. So that's what I had in mind, putting faces to names and really bringing out the truth and making it hard for people to ignore. And that's what I want people to take away from it. I want them to say, okay, this is real. This is what's going on. Now, what can I do about it? I want, it, I want, it, I want to use it as an education tool. As a young person, um, you mentioned going to Cleveland and being a part of the protest. And I'm sure there were other young persons there as well that most likely share the feelings that you have. What advice would you give to a young person that sees what's going on, wants the change, is talented in the way that you are, what advice would you give them in sharing, let's say if they wanted to publish a book or being able to share their story or the stories of others, what advice would you give them? Um, I would say just, just do it, even if you don't know what you're doing. I had no idea what I was doing at all. I was writing a book. I had no idea how I was going to publish it. I had no idea how I was going to get um cover art. I had no idea what a formatter was, um, anything. I had no idea what I was doing. I had a whole book in front of me and I had no idea what to do with it. 
and the length of it, because I write poems relatively fast, especially if I'm if I'm really um, passionate about the subject. Um, the the lengthiest part of it was getting those interviews and then doing a bunch of legal stuff for the interview so that I have permission, you know, legal permission to use the content, finding a formatter, um, an editor, a proofreader, um, getting someone to write the forward, all different types of stuff. And I just figured it out as I went and now it's here. Um, don't let it intimidate you. I know it can be very intimidating. I was very intimidated. Like many times I thought, you know what, I'm gonna just forget it you know, and just leave it alone. Somebody else will do it. But you can't think like that. Um, you have to do it, um, especially if something that you're passionate about. Put yourself out there and things will fall into place. You'll learn as you go. And when you get frustrated, think of it as a learning experience and a way to make you stronger for your future. Um, but just, I would just say, just do it. Um, that's what I would have told myself nine months ago when I was when I started you know like it's gonna be difficult but you could do it and just figure it out as you go and um confide in others I don't think I could have done it without you know my parents helping me um my family helping me um my grandmother is the one um that um got me in contact with a formatter. You know, I couldn't have done it without my family looking out for me. So don't be afraid to confide in others because no one truly does anything on their own. Um, you might be the heart of it all, but you have other people helping you and take advantage of those people. Take advantage of the people that want to help you. Don't be shy to say, since you're doing this, you mind helping me with this too? Because, I mean, we're young, we're Black, and um, we're the future, and so we have to set good examples and really be about our business um, to be where we want to be so that we can better help our community. So I would say just just go for it. Yeah. I love that. We're young, we're Black, and we are the future. So mm -hmm. what does the future have in store for you, Michaela? What's next on the agenda? Will you continue writing about these types of topics or is there something else you're passionate about? Um, so I don't think I'll ever stop writing about these types of topics, um, but I do have another passion. Um, not My passion is writing. I really cannot imagine myself doing anything else but writing. I really feel like it would be, I tell this, I say this all the time, it would be torture for me to do anything else but writing. I think of any other profession, you grow up and you're like, I want to be a veterinarian. I want to be a ballerina. For me, it was always, I want to be a ballerina and a New York bestselling author. I want to be a veterinarian and a writer. Um, it was always that for me. I cannot do anything else. I don't think I have it in me. Um, my first love is poetry. My second love is journalism. So let's combine the two. And my third love is um, children's books. I love the way a child, I know I'm not that older than, you know, I don't have that many years on me, but um, I like the way a, a child's mind works. I think it's so beautiful. A child can look at a mansion and say, mom, why don't we move in there today? And they don't see, I remember saying that, they don't see a reason why. And the parent thinking about all these reasons why they can't, you know, they don't have the money for it. Someone else lives in the house, you know? Um, but the child's just like, let's just go. And I just love that. And I never, ever want to lose that side of me. Of course, I have to be like, a, like an adult. But I never, ever want to lose that um, childlike wonder inside of me. And I feel like that really helps someone write because it helps with your imagination. And um, that's, I really do care about that. Um, but next topic I feel myself writing about would be um, mental health as it relates to relationships. Um, I've been through a lot in the past year. I was um, in, a, in a behavioral wellness hospital for about my first half of my senior year um, for a bad relationship I got out of. Um, and I know that adults 
sometimes adults tend to downplay um, high school teenage relationships and everything. And I see why, um, but it's the best love for what that person knows. And it's very impactful. And I went to the hospital and the nurse told me that 70% of the girls my age are there for the same reason I was. So 70% of girls my age are in mental hospitals or behavioral wellness hospitals um, for um, bad relationships, abusive relationships, bad breakups. And that's what they're there for, just like me. And so obviously it's a very apparent problem. Um, and I learned a lot. I had to go through a lot. I'm just now getting to the point where I'm okay. And, I, and I've struggled with, um, I have a predisposition to depression and anxiety throughout my entire life. I didn't know, like I knew there was something um, wrong with me as a child, I just didn't know what it was. And then I got to high school and then I was officially diagnosed. And then um, I've been struggling with this, um, struggling with um, being suicidal, struggling. I'm trying, I'm gonna be so very blunt and frank because you know, even though I'm putting my business out there because people need to know that they're not the only one, only ones that are going through this. Um, and that's one of my other passions when it comes to writing. Um, I, I feel like I, for so long, I thought I was the only one. I thought there was something wrong with me and, and there's nothing wrong with me. Um, it's just something that I have to deal with and everybody has their own way of de dealing with it. Some people go on medicine. Some people, um, I don't know, they, they figure out how to cope. For me, I can't do medicine because I feel like it blunts um, emotions and I need my emotions to write. Um, so I just wanna, I just want, I just want all the teenage girls, teenage and young adult girls to know that they are not alone um, and that they can get through it, whatever it is, um, because I did and I really didn't think I could. Um, it really tested me. Um, it was it was very very bad worst I've ever been with my with my um, mental health and I came out of it I survived and I'm here and I'm at Oakwood I'm at a good spot in my life I just published a book I'm very very happy proud of myself um, and it came to the point where I told myself even if no one buys the book at least I did it you know at least I did it and I came out of what I went through and I came out strong um, and that's what matters to me. So I really want to um, publish a work about that. And I've written a book about it. I wrote a book about that before I even wrote this book. Um, it's about 50 poems, 50 poems long or so, 55 poems. Um, it's just very, very important, important to me that people understand that they're, they're not the only ones. Because I can't imagine going through all of that and thinking that you're the only one because you're not. You mentioned being blunt and, and putting your business out there. And I think it's really just transparency, what you're talking mm -hmm. about. Um, mm -hmm. And the lack of transparency that we see everywhere mm -hmm. and how important it is for people that have experienced certain things to share those experiences in an open, honest, transparent way so that others won't feel alone, just like you said. So thank you for that. And I'm sure that there are many, many young women that have been and will continue to be impacted by your story, um, by the work you're doing as well. Uh, you mentioned that you've already written a series of poems on this topic. I'd love for you to send that information to me so that we can share that as well. Mm -hmm. you're, you're an advocate you are an advocate. And I think it's great what you're doing. Before we close, what would you like to tell your readers, present readers and persons that have yet to discover your, your work? What would you like to say to them? Mm, I have never thought about this before. Um, or what would you like them to know about you, about you, Michaela? I just, I would just like them to, to know 
that I'm just like them. I want them to know that I'm just like them and I'm just trying to figure it out. And um, I read this quote where it said, I want, um, I'm not sure if I'm playing it exactly, but it said something like, um, when I'm gone, I want people to pick up my work and read me on the pages and say, I would have liked her. And that's, that's, that means a lot to me for someone to, to look at. And you put yourself on those pages. You really do. You put, when you write, you put yourself in your writing. It's a very vulnerable thing to do, um, to write and then share it. Um, I want people to, to pick me up off the pages and say, I would have, I would have liked her. I would have liked to meet her. That, 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 just saying that, it makes my heart feel warm and fuzzy. I just, it mean, it would mean so much for me. I, I really want them to enjoy it and um, get something from it um, and share it with others so that they can get something from it. Mm -hmm. um, even if, I, I was talking to my friends, um, I think it was last night, about if we had one wish, what would it be? And my friends were saying, my wish would be that I would be rich or do, and everything like that. And in my head, I was like, my wish to be a New York bestselling author. Um, and I remember thinking um, about being rich. And if I had to choose between being rich and impacting the world through my writing, I would choose impacting the world. Um, because when it comes down to it, if you have a fire, if you have a fire in you for something, there's really nothing, nothing material wise that's more important. Um, I really want people to know that, that I don't care about um, stuff like that. I just really, really care about just, just writing, just the art of it all. It's so beautiful. And I want people to see that I think it's beautiful through my writing. Thank you so much, Michaela. Thank you for your stories. Thank you for, for just all of the work that you're doing. You are an inspiration and we will continue to pray for you. We expect to see so much more incredible works from you. And we encourage everyone to get a copy of the book. It's What We Fight For by Michaela Maddox. And we will post a link on our website at the Allegheny West Conference. Thank you again for spending some time with me. It's been wonderful. And will you come back again when you publish your next book? Definitely. Thank you for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Wonderful. So I'll hold you to that. And mm -hmm. so I'll see you next time. Okay. Bye.